couple people message me about the follow-up for my lab, and I still see people. I, I'm happy that my video on Citrix Zen server is doing well, but I have mentioned to people, just replace all of that. The, the video is still relevant. Just change everything over to XCP NG or Next Generation as a uh, replacement for a Citrix Zen server. I replaced all of my servers with it. I know someone's screaming, but Tom, test Proxmox. I tested it. Maybe I'll go at it again. I know they released a new version. It really, I don't know, I didn't like it as much as I like the whole Zen server. And part of it is I started getting into Citrix because I had some clients running it. And I have a friend working at a very large company with tons of VMs, and they're very happy with the way it works. Everything goes well. I didn't like the way Citrix changed the licensing around. I'm a huge fan of open source software. The Zen itself is open source and then Citrix puts their own spin on it. These guys over here at the xcpng.org really did a nice job. They kicked off a Kickstarter, got funded, and rebuilt Zen Server next generation. They've added some new features. All the features are enabled, not like Citrix, where we're going, where they took the open source project and stripped out features and then spun it for you. So you had to go recompile it yourself if you want. It was, well, more than that. They were being Citrix. So watch my rant video on it. I'm not going to go on about it. I didn't like the way they handled it, and neither did they. And it turns out the community was really happy because they well were overfunded for uh, what their original goal was, which is great because that you know is going to push for further development on this product. Uh, and their business model is simple: they offer pro pro support, so 100% no licenses, no registration needed, just to even get a download, like Citrix is doing. Um, and there's a couple different ways to manage it. So let me first start with the layout of all this. So we'll start here, just to give you a brief overview. I have two servers, one called backup that's usually not turned on, it's only on when I need it because it's a plan B if this explodes, either the free NAS explodes or this explodes. Those are unlikely scenarios, but that's what you're planning for in IT, unlikely scenarios, you know, things like something happening to the building physically or whatever. We do full VM backups. I've covered this before and we take them off site. Uh, it gives me a level of, level of comfort that I can restore, not in days, but in hours from a complete, like my building's not here anymore type of scenario. Hopefully that never occurs, uh, but you always plan for the worst, hope for the best. That's a good plan to go with backups. Have backups of your backups and a plan to go around the backups of how, what you're gonna do instead. Okay, before we dwell on that, my Zen backup server is the in-house backup server. I have another server at my house that can be used as well to help run my company uh, that's also running Zen. So Zen backup, and then we have uh, the affectionately named Zenifer, but all this is running XCPNG. Then we have our free NAS, machine and the free NAS is the storage server for this one but not for this one and the reason why is this points of failure so this has a 10 gig connection to all my vms here because i play with a lot of vms for my youtube channel for ideas i have and my hobby is playing with virtual machines and setting up scenarios and sometimes you have to set up scenarios for client special projects and other off the wall things I work on. So we build out all kinds of uh, virtualized infrastructure, test it out or test theories I have or t you know demo new software, even not just for the YouTube channel, but you know for example, when we had to uh, come up with a custom config for a client shop, no problem. We just built it in the virtual lab. Does this work the way we think it works? Yes, it does cool deploy. Uh, when we're testing backup software, uh, people always ask me to test things. I've done videos like we, we had a custom backup solution that we used instead of the Solar Winds product, the client wanted to use something else. And that introduced me to Cloudberry, which I've talked about before. I really like their product. And we did all the testing. You build your VMs, you randomly crash them, you see how Cloudberry handles uh, the restores. And I have a video on that. And we did it all in a virtual lab because that's really convenient to do. So I have this 10 gig connection here and then there's a series of drives inside the FreeNAS. One set of drives is for my production stuff that I don't really do anything else with. That way none of my lab stuff could potentially cause any potential issues with my production. Plus I do the uh, IVM, I'm sorry, LVM over iSCSI. That's how these are connected to each other. And I don't really want to worry about any performance degradation or anything like that. So all of that is sitting on a set of production drives that is what I've referred to as production drives on the FreeNAS. Then I have my FreeNAS lab set of drives. It's another ZFS array. So I have 
all of it broke down into two separate arrays. That's how I keep things separate in terms of performance, and we'll get to that in a second. So then we have um, the networks, and I kind of have it broke out here. So this is like the secure network that the production stuff attaches to, and there's multiple physical network cards in these devices to keep them physically separated. And I know someone's screaming, just put it all on a series of VLANs and stuff like that. Yeah, I know I could. Uh, I have an unmanaged switch, and that's just, there's no need to worry about management. They physically plug in. There's no worries about interference or congestion. Everything that uh, runs the company is on these purple ones here. Then we have the Unify switch, which does have all kinds of VLANs and uh, trunking and everything else that happens here. Now, PFSense is the glue that holds this together. So the internet comes in, comes into PFSense. It distributes to the purple network, which, you know, like I said, the purple network being a secure network, everything is statically assigned, uh, not even a DHCP server on there. So everything's very restrictive and only a couple pinhole rules that allow only the necessar necessities uh, to pass through here to get to anything over here. Because this is, like I said, where we host our internal uh, software. And then each one of the Linux machines that runs inside of there are hardened as well. Uh, so if you were inside that network, lateral movement isn't possible because they, they have their own firewall set up and their own sets of rules that keep you from just logging into them. There's no open ports other than what's necessary, blah, blah, blah. That's kind of how we keep that, you know, level of separation. And that's also why they're on an unmanaged switch. They're really, really, really locked down. And most things, even if you're using a managed switch, by the way, because all the virtual servers are actually running here on the Xenifer box, even if you physically unplug Xenifer from the unmanaged switch, they can all talk to each other because when you create a virtual machine and you put everything on the same network, there's technically a there's actually a tool called vSwitch, but there's always at least a level of virtual switching going on because they all tie together. Let me show you how that works real quick. So I have this kind of maybe a little bit confusing, but like this is the when I build a PFSense test lab. This is from that video. You can build virtual switches and pretend this is just a network cable plugging these two devices. But if you were to create another device like this, I'm going to pull it in here because I just duplicated it outside there. But if you do that, these devices, sorry, it looks kind of goofy, um, are on the same network. So, because they're not leaving to go outside of the network. So, everything that we create inside of our uh, virtual lab, oh, there we go, uh, everything we create in the virtual lab here automatically gets to be on the same network. So, as you create these other virtual boxes, even if there's nothing outside, this represents things inside, they all get attached. So even if you have a managed switch to say, to put some routing saying the two devices can't talk to each other, they will, because they don't go out to the switch and back, they're done internally. There's ways you can make it do that, but uh, the default way, and this is the way we have it set up. So before I digress too far into network switching and routing, uh, the Unify switch is VLAN enabled, and uh, that's how we handle all the other networking. So that way we can have VLAN tagging on either one of these and the uh, and the uh, free NAS and create different virtual LANs. Now the 10 gigabit link between here is a direct connection, no switch in between. This is, I did a video on this of how to set up 10 gig networking. I, I do it with Citrix N server, but it applies once again exactly the same to XCPNG. Now this is a, like I said, uh, I really call it the TwinX SFP Plus direct line plugin. You just statically assign an IP to the free NAS on that for that network interface, you statically assign one over here to the network interface. And now these two devices talk over 10 gigabits. So when you're doing your iSCSI target, you just use this the, that 10, the 10 gigabit IP address. And there's no routing needed. There's not even a gateway needed. Matter of fact, leave the gateway out because if you put a gateway in, it'll think it's something you can route over. So that's not even necessary to make that work. So you just put these in and then it just becomes your storage or SAN network, uh, SAN. That sand, sand, S A N, <laughs> um, to get the data talking back and forth. But this provides a really fast link at 10 gigabit uh, for getting all the data back and forth. It will work over one gigabit. You can do iSCSI over one gigabit and use free NAS to your storage. And it's actually quite fast. Uh, maybe sometime I just got to sit down and like build it out, but I'll do a test scenario for uh, 10 gig versus one gig performance and what you get from it. I will tell you the speed at the 10 gig is, I uh, believe is faster than the drives can handle, even though they're a ZFS array. Uh, 
I'm getting close to, not completely, but close to SSD performance in the 400 and 500 uh, megabit range of drive speed. So you see in really nice, and I'll show you the demo real quick on how fast the drives are. So we're gonna close this. Don't need to save my goof ups there. And let's actually look at the software running. So this, and this is me playing with it, like I said, uh, well, that's the wrong one. Let's just go a little further back. Um, these are all the VMs I have, and this is the Zen Orchestra, and this is mostly how I manage it. Now, for those of you wondering, and I'll just cover it real quick, there is the XCPNG Center. This is in beta. I haven't had any problems with it at all. I've tested with it. It seems to work perfectly fine. I got the two different servers connected to it, XCPNG and Xenifer, and all the VMs that you can see here that we have set up. Um, it works fine. I just don't use it that much. I don't have a big use case for it. The only thing, and I've talked to the developers and they're gonna be adding, is when you're setting up on Xenifer here, and I have, and I go to network, uh, the only thing they don't have is an ability to create, uh, that's, that's the next, um, Side, this side only, like this LAN only exists on Xenifer's, the description that I typed in. You notice how it's not VLAN, it's not bound to a NIC. The only thing you can't do that I know of right now, and like I said, there's a I have a request on GitHub for them to fix this, and they said they would, um, is to create a uh, host-only networking. And one of the reason we use host-only networking is like if you watch my VPN, uh, what leaks out of a VPN video, you can create a host-only network on here. And it said when you don't tie it to a network card, there's absolutely no noise on it. It exists only inside of this machine. And by doing that, it's a great way to create an isolated network where you can say, all right, here's this device, here's this device. And for example, when we set up a virtual PF Sense for testing or for full network scanning, because we were uh, doing that with Wireshark uh, in that video, you want to watch exactly what goes across. You don't want to worry about anything else being on the line, so you can just create these. And if you're ever doing any testing with security software or you wanted to do any malware testing or anything uh, like that, once again, put it on its own uh, separated network. It can never escape because it doesn't have a physical network card to leave. It only can do in there. And it's easy to do when you go to add network. You can uh, single server private network. They're, they, like I said, they're going to add that. Now, cross server network is kind of neat. This is where I mentioned that there's a vSwitch software. If you use vSwitch, you can then extend that host only, not tied to a network card network to other servers. So vSwitch, you merge all the servers in, and maybe I'll do a demo on that at some point. It's a virtual switch, and you can take all your XCPNG servers or Citrix servers and merge them all so they all share a virtual switch. And uh, that's a little bit more complicated and goes a little outside of the scope we're going to talk to here. And here's how you put the VLAN IDs on there. I've had a couple people tell me they don't work. I don't understand. They're right here, they work. They're VLAN 10. And when you add a network, and we'll just run through it real quick. So if we uh, external network, new network, there's your VLAN ID, and you fig figure out what physical NIC you want to tie it to, set the VLAN ID. I've done this many times. You can do this in both here and the XCPNG software. So for all your normal stuff, it works perfectly fine. Uh, there's that storage network that I talked about, and you can see it down here. And these are your uh, storage.2. Uh, I called it storage two because I was running some storage across there. Sometimes I, I, for testing purposes, I have it called storage two. Storage 10G, here's that one here. You notice how there's a lack of a gateway. So uh, this is 10.15 and the free NAS is 10.10 and that's how they talk to each other with the iSCSI for the storage. And here's how you can look at the storage. Like I said, if you've looked at my video on Citrix, and this actually applies completely. Now, a couple people asked about things like thin provisioning. Um, LVM over Sky iSCSI with Zen server as a whole uh, does not support thin provisioning that I know of under this. And if you're not familiar with thin provisioning, um, it's when you allocate a server, let's say 100 gigs, it actually pulls the 100 gigs from here. It does, but it doesn't when you use FreeNAS and ZFS as your back end. First, when I'm designing this, if you have uh, 10 terabytes of storage, you can put five or six terabytes 
less than the maximum on there. That will give ZFS plenty of headroom to automatically compress and make everything work right. Uh, maybe I want to, if I if they have time, I want to get one of the FreeNAS engineers to get on there and explain it. And this is how you can keep um, away from fragmentation because as long as FreeNAS has a lot of room, so when you design it, you have all this room in there. Now, why does that matter for thin provisioning? Well, really simple is in I think I may have covered this in a video. If not, I'll, I'll look. Maybe I'll do another video on this. I'd love to get the FreeNAS engineers because I've talked to them about this uh, a couple times. When you are allocating this, maybe I allocate 100 gigs for a virtual machine over LVM iSCSI. It doesn't take up 100 gigs on FreeNAS because FreeNAS ZFS goes, there's a lot of blank space, and ZFS compression goes, I'm just going to use what's needed. So you, you can potentially over provision that way um, because FreeNAS is going, hey, these are all compressed. The downside is when you over provision, if you ever expand those, you run into a really big problem if you did over provision. So I highly recommend never over provisioning, but it will do some compression and be more efficient with it. And that also cuts down any fragmentation. So I'll get someone more intelligent on this, uh, perhaps at some time to talk about it. I'm also friends, look up Michael Lucas. He wrote two books on ZFS if you want a better understanding of it. I've met him and hung out with him so Several times he happens to live in a Detroit area. Guy's a genius on this stuff. He has a lot of good books. So before I digress on that, if you want some learning, <laughs> look up Michael Lucas and all of his uh, Linux and ZFS books. All right, so enough about this. I mean, this works perfectly fine. I've used the beta. Like I said, I have any problems with it. I think it will still connect to Zen servers uh, that are done by Citrix as well. But the Citrix Zen Center won't connect uh, to the newer version of XCPNG. It gives an error. So that's what this is. And I'll leave you a link where you can download this. I'm going to shut this down. I, like I said, I don't use it very often, uh, but I want to show you that it exists for those of you that are used to using it that way. The only time I've used it is if i got to create new networks that are locked down like I've shown. So here's the Zen Orchestra. And I. so you have the full feature set. Uh, I've got the Community Edition pulled up. Now, Community Edition means, just let me head a little bit down, means like it says here. No support. That's because this is, you know, rolled myself. Uh, you, I maintain it. This is, you know, for my virtual lab playing and stuff like that. It, and some of my production stuff runs in here. They have a free version. Now, there's a couple differences in a free version. I think it did be one. The free version lacks, uh, like the backup isn't enabled in there. Uh, and some of the statistics pages you can't view. So if we go here, we go to hosts, we go here, stats. Um, this is not enabled when you have the free version. Now, the free version, obviously, is designed for home use. This is open source one uh, that is, you know, the full version, but you have no support from them. And if you want paid support, you go to Zen Orchestra. And the Zen Orchestra people are the people also behind the XCPNG. There's a crossover of developers on both of them. That's why they're so good at doing all this. And this is a, a great tool for managing the VMs. So if you have a lot of servers it's worth buying their paid version and of course it comes with full support um, and you can do all kinds of fun stuff with it they add even more availability in the paid version than you have here i forget what else they roll in uh, they have some vsan stuff exosan i think it is yeah not available the they have exosan they have a lot of advanced features if you manage at scale a lot of these so take a look at that product it's great for purposes of this, I can leave you, I think I've done a video on where you can get this. There's a couple auto install scripts that will build this for you. Um, I, it has broken before, FYI, when you're building this. Uh, sometimes you got to goof around with it. So yeah, it's not supported and just jump in there and start working on it. So let's talk about the server. So I'm going to go uh, filter for production. Like here's the servers that generally run our company. Uh, we are still running free PBX in here. Uh, OSEC to keep a babysit on all my stuff. This is the DB9XO. This is the free version of XO. Because when you do updates and break this, you need another way to manage it sometimes. Uh, you can also manage a lot of this from the command line. Uh, that's something I do a lot too. You can import, export VMs and move things around with the Zen command line. Maybe one day I'll just do a video on all the command line interface stuff you can do. It's pretty slick. And if you manage things at scale frequently, you go to the command line to uh, mass start up or start things, start stop, and move things around. I've actually covered this in how the backups are done. I played with the backups in here. They seem to work pretty well, too. Uh, but I like the backup script because, well, I like scripts that automate things. And look for my video on backing up Zen servers. There's, I have links to the script and how to set it up. It's not too extensive, but I, I walk through the details. But 
here are the machines that run the wiki server, the Unify video. Uh, kind of a neat feature is being able to go right here, see what their usage is. Free PBX, and this is the, uh, we're sunsetting, this is our old POS system, I didn't bother loading. But with the tools loaded, it gives you stats right here. Free PBX didn't like the tools loaded. Well, it probably did. I, it didn't recognize the Sangoma spin of CentOS, I just didn't force it, and I don't care that much. Um, without the tools loaded, though, you don't have the memory usage stats. It doesn't have as much detail in there. And when we look at any one of these, you can see the disk throughput, network throughput, memory usage, two hours, last week, things like that. So, and once again, this is because it's in the community edition. The stats are something they took out of uh, the other one. So you can look at any of them. Now, if we do none, you can see all my different VMs I have running. And we have a lot of stuff. Like right now, we're doing some testing with uh, this Windows Server 2016 because I have another video coming up and I'll tell you, it's, whoops, it is related to FreeNAS in Server 2016. Uh, we did some, once again, some testing scenarios and stuff we're playing with on there and um, it's it's uh, upcoming, that, that's later. <laughs> but it does work, by the way. The, we figured that much out, They're tying them together and I'm, a lot of people are asking for a walkthrough on that and it's gonna come on how to make this work in your network. Uh, but Running FreeNAS inside here before someone even asked, not a great idea. It's FreeNAS is best for uh, setting up directly with a bunch of disks. I wouldn't, I don't have a big scenario why I would want to run it in here, but you can do nested virtualization if you want to try. I don't know how well it works, but I don't recommend running FreeNAS in here. We're going to run it in here because it's easy to uh, run it as a test server and uh, build out a scenario and then delete it when we're done or reset everything rather than building a physical free NAS box. Way easier to build them here. Same with PFSense. Um, I have my PFSense lab right here. It's It works. Uh, there's a couple things you're, I don't believe the traffic shaping works as well. There's always little quirks whenever you run virtualized uh, instances of firewalls. You can make it work. It it's a little bit trickier. Not to me. I, I always run it on real hardware. Um, and if you type in not just in Zen, but if you type in like PF Sense uh, in any type of hypervisor, there's always a tricky parts of making it work. And I believe the people over at PF Sense are working on a new uh, in the cloud system, as they call it, that is designed to run in things like AWS and Azure. So there's other stuff coming and other stuff designed more for that. Like I said, I run everything on the physical hardware when it comes to my networking equipment. All the machines here, you know, being able to create snapshots, that's all fine and dandy, that works great. And let's actually show here, let me uh, filter for some of the lab stuff. Here's like my Debian 9 base on Xenifer. And here's the, you know, XCP and backup. And uh, we, you can go here, I can get to the console, get to the network. Oh, this works by the way, the console, uh, if we go here, Works fine for Windows and things like that if you don't want to uh, SSH in or anything like that. You can do that. We actually we use our screen connect to connect to the Windows boxes in there and just SSH for the uh, Debian ones. But like here's my uh, Debian base. So here's the networks that you've seen. And like here's that LAN of Zen.2.3. That's the ending of them. Uh, you can, but I would not recommend it. Connect it to like my storage network. And here's a couple of those VLANs I have, VLAN 10 and VLAN 69. Uh, so even while it's running, it's like, okay, if we want to swap it to another network, drop it on VLAN 69. It's going to take a second and then these will refresh right here to tell me what the IP address is here, or we can go to the console. And it's changed now to 172. It changes right away and it takes a second or so, and then it'll refresh in here. So it takes, I don't know, maybe, and it's a, it changes the IP address immediately. It just takes a little while before this part refreshes. This is the, and you have to have the Zen tools loaded to do this, but that's not really why we're here. Actually, let's put it back on the dot three network. Go back over to console. And right now it's right, it's changed. I know it's kind of small to read, but it's right back on the dot three network. And we'll talk a little bit. Now this is on the lab drives, not on the production drives. And so let's go over here. Well, this probably, all right, we're SSH'd into it. So there's that address 192.168.3.190. And I was actually just running some uh, tests on it right here. So we'll do three, 
This is the Foronix uh, test suite free to download. Uh, all I'm doing is as a demo here, I know there's this is not a extensive benchmark. There's a ton of factors that go into it. But just in general, if you want to talk about the speed that the machine can run at, what it can do performance wise, and like I said, these are the lab drives. And we're getting about, uh, was that 480 on there? Grant, these are smaller tests and these are general. And there's, you know, I've always liked this. There's lies, damn lies, statistics, and then there's benchmarks. And you can, synthetic benchmarks are so hard to reference directly and you have to do really extensive, not just, oh, I ran this file test and it moved a file across this fast. So that's how fast it is, right? There's so many more factors. Like, are you running databases? Are you running VMs on here? What are you running on there? Because your load case will change and there's planning and that's where the engineers come in. Uh, like when we sell a really an enterprise level thing like TrueNAS, you work with the engineering team to understand the workloads that go into it to design the system to go with it. This is just a basic, you know, um, ZFS system, RAID Z2 setup uh, for my lab drives, and it, it works perfectly fine and, you know, stores data. So there's the test running. We're seeing 527. What is that on the, uh, scroll down. Yeah, 527 on the writes. The reads are at 403. <laughs> Weird, the writes are a little bit faster. But you can see pretty good performance on there. Now, because I can restore these back and forth to different VMs, move them around, that's actually some of the cool features. I can migrate this VM running over to another machine. But one little hiccup here, let's go over here to the hosts. So here's uh, this system here, the XCPM backup. The problem is this backup happens to be on an AMD box. And we go over here to the hosts. This one's on an Intel. That being said, this is actually running on an, uh, the PowerEdge R710, works perfectly fine. I know it's an older box, someone's going, but put it in the cloud, buy a brand new one, blah, 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 whatever. Um, the uh, This box here, being that it's Intel, you can't pass if the architecture types are too different. You can have maybe a different processor, I don't know how far out there you can get, but as long as the feature sets of the processors are the same, then you can move running VMs back and forth. You can't move running VMs back and forth if there's architecture type difference because the computers go, the computer itself does get to see into the processor. And uh, because of that, so if we, oops, uh, we'll just do this cat, slash. Because the VMs can see that this is an Intel Xeon uh, X5 5670 at 2.9 gigahertz, it sees the processors. Uh, that information can't change in a running VM very well. I think there's some work or some tools probably that do allow certain things to happen. But for scope of the way it works, default install here, no, you can't just move between machines if they're completely different uh, architecture types in a processor. So I can't move a running machine. But what I can do is move a machine that is running on Intel, uh, shut it down, move it, boot it up, and it'll just rediscover the processor. So let's go here show you that it's stopping. We're going to stop this VM. And this is kind of my handy dandy uh, Debian 9 base is kind of like it says. I use it as the base for uh, upgrading or building any of the VMs. So we're going to go here to fast clone. We click it and go here and it'll actually add the word clone to it. And I didn't, uh, this is all in real time. I didn't have to cut this because it clones like that now cloned. This now I fire up the clone and you'll see how fast this is. I'm going to call it uh, our YouTube demo. Whoops. Hold on. I clicked on uh, the screen. I go back here. It got locked in the uh, bottom part so it wouldn't let me type. Debian base YouTube demo. Oh, by the way, it was booted already while I was goofing around. Uh, it boots up in a couple seconds. Granted, this VM is only, it cloned that fast, which the VM itself has got just a 16 gig drive and uh, one gig of RAM. So it's it boots up like immediately, it's fast, uh, everything works, and because it's a clone, actually, let's go ahead so connection closed. It's a clone and it's actually uh, probably going to get the same IP address. We'll know here in a session. Let's log in. Look. 
Yep, got the same IP address over here. And if you look at the last commands run, look, <laughs> same commands are run because it's an it's an absolute clone of it. But that's the nice thing about so I can take something, uh, do a clone. Then I can, if I need to, we'll go over here. If I needed to create a snapshot, it'll create a snapshot that quick. So now I have a snapshot of it, and if I need to roll it back, I can revert this, and it'll restart the VM back at the snapshot. I'm going to go ahead and delete it because I don't care about doing it right now. So this makes it really easy to handle uh, moving the VMs around. Now, right now, this by default, it always creates them on the FreeNAS lab drive. So if we go back over here, we're just going to stop the VM because it'll move way faster. It'll move uh, live VMs. They move faster when they're not live, and I'm not patient right now. But let's migrate the storage to another part. So like I said, when you go to the uh, storage, and I'm going to open up a new window, so I'm going to close that. Here's our production one where all of the production's sitting. And it shows you how much is used, how much is provisioned. And these, like I said, this is not thin provision. So it says 256. So out of the six terabytes that I have assigned to this, there's actually 10 terabytes available. This way I can never over provision. But the actual usage on here, because of the compression ratios, you can see it's compressing at 1.49. So you're getting this bigger uh, compression efficiency to keep down fragmentation and everything else and keep up speed and it works really, really well. So you're not, even though it's got this much, it, it's, like I said, I'm gonna get an engineer who can explain this better. I've talked to them about it and this is the way, how they have it set up. I believe I've got it all set up right. Uh, but I think it'd be a fun conversation to talk about storage planning with one of their engineers. I'm gonna see if they'll reach out to us and uh, be able to get one of them on there. So we've worked with them on on a few things, but I think that'd be kind of fun. Because getting into this, uh, how storage works is is really cool. <laughs> so, But it's also really complicated and I wanna make sure it's uh, right. But before we get too far off topic, let's migrate this over to my production where we have actually newer, faster hard drives. We go to here to production and migrate all VDIs. If you actually had a bunch of virtual disks attached to this, you could. So we're just gonna migrate the one. We'll hit okay. And this will move over really fast. So if we look over here at tasks, it actually sits here at 0% for a second. I Probably a preparation thing it does. And then you'll watch it kind of scoot right across. But the machine while we're doing this is not under uh, duress. Everything else works perfectly fine. We can play with other stuff. We can still clone. All the other features work because it'll stack all the tasks over in here. See, now it's 9, 10. Then you're going to watch a couple hops where it jumps. Drink some coffee while this goes. What's weird is if you move a bigger VM, it doesn't take, it doesn't scale exactly. When I move some of the larger VMs, um, they still seem to move about the same amount of time, maybe a little bit longer for them. So there's not, uh, as I've moved around, because we added uh, more hard drives recently and swapped them over. So we, because ZFS can't be expanded, if you're not familiar with that, you can't just expand um, and build, add to. So I always rebuild and we just put these new drives in, um, which by the way, if you wanna know what drives I'm using real quick, all the drives in our uh, stack of free NAS system are these uh, Death Star NASs. I've been thrilled with them, knock on wood, no failures. We've used these a lot. Uh, they they came recommended, so to speak, if you watch my video on Backblaze and their stats, these are the drives that they have the least amount of problems with over time. Um, and they have a ton of them in there. So the Backblaze stats, and I, I have a video on that, that break down you know, what those stats mean and why they're important. And it's it's hard to get aggregate drive testing. I mean, I could probably sit there and tell you from a retail consumer what comes across the counter that, oh, this particular drive is bad, we see a high failure rate. But what you don't have is the other side of that stat, that's why you can't say that properly, is do you have the stat for how many were in the market? So you can say, I see fewer of these failing, but very few were sold. Well, yeah, statistically, if all of them failed, you wouldn't see that many. So you gotta make sure you understand how the stats are done. Well, that's something they break down over there at Backblaze is we have 8,000 of these hard drives running for six months and this is how many failed. Now you have a score and a statistic because you have the different factors. You know how many there were because they could have one, it never fails and they'd have a 100% non-failure rate because they had one installed and it never failed. That's not a good statistic. Uh, they break all that down and we have had, uh, knock on wood, have had the same experience where we haven't had any of these bad. The only one that I've ever returned um, of these Death Stars was one that we, we actually tested it out of the box. We pulled it and this was a while ago. It was a strange thing and they replaced it for us. We did test it and it was bad. The whole corner 
of the hard drive was cracked. Brand new out of the box. And we were like, uh, we're, they're going to blame us for dropping it because we cut the seal on this. Someone dropped the hard drive and put it in a box. Only time it's ever happened in my life. And I tell you, we have went through stacks of hard drives, building raid arrays, fixing raid arrays with these drives. And I've never, ever in my life of 20 years in career seen a hard drive out of the box like the corner was smashed, like it was dropped on cement. And the drive was bad. It's the only time we have one of these desk tires, NAS isn't returned. But uh, they work really well. We have the two terabyte versions in, in our thing, three terabyte versions in there. And the last array we built was just with the four terabyte ones because that's big enough for uh, the VMs we store. Matter of fact, we're not even using all of it as you've seen when you look at the line here. And this fully runs everything, plus we have a lab that's not full either. So uh, if people ask, why did you go bigger? Uh, what For what? I don't store that much data. Matter of fact, most of our VMs are actually quite small. So anyways, while I was babbling about that, this completed, we're gonna go over here and take a look at, whoops, let's go to uh, YouTube. There's our YouTube demo. We're going to start it up. And now it's on the production disk, which are a little bit faster. Which now I'm curious because I think I've seen, and I'll the roll back in the video, but I think we've seen like 450 or so on the other VM. I wonder if I can pull that up. By the way, this software is really fast. I love it. So that's part of the other reason I like using it as a web interface. It just it just goes. Okay, stats go away. I thought that's what I thought when you uh, power off the machine. I'll flick power it back on. But uh, this is booted up. Probably has the same IP address. And we'll just check. Yep, look at that. Up arrow a couple times and we'll run that same test. Nope, I feel like saving results. Maybe one day I'll sit down and just play with benchmarks all day. Problem is I get aggravated because of how long they take. I mean, you can script it, but then I got to organize all that and then put all the data, the results. And yeah, I'm kind of, sometimes are, I'm less interested in benchmarks. Uh, I, I like production machines. I like working and thinking about stuff, but the benchmarks are kind of something fun to do to show that it works fast. Uh, so... Actually, here's what's fun. The production ones are a lot faster. Here's what, when it was booting, we hit uh, 817. So here's the first test and it's gonna go back. For, we'll let this run for a second. One of the things you can do when you're looking at the storage pools, production, stats, you can look at the storage itself. See your IO wait time, the IOPS, the uh, what it's hitting in terms of that. And this is where you're gonna get two different stats. Let me explain why. This is looking at the realistic storage on all this versus the other one is looking at the storage as the VM sees it. So because there's a lot of caching and different layers going on in between, you're gonna get that. Now, let's go another step further and pull up net data. This is net data running on my FreeNAS. So here's where we just started that test. So you do see some uh, spikes in here for, this is us moving a drive, nothing that's loading it up. I mean, real, realistically, what we see, 36% CPU usage. In my FreeNAS, by the way, uh, I'll give you the stats on it. Everyone always wants to know what the specs are on it. Uh, system, it is 16. I need to add more RAM to it. It's on my to-do list. FreeNAS, 11.1 uh, U5 with an Intel Core i5 at 3.2 gigahertz. Certainly nothing, actually, let me get you a model number real quick. i5-4570, older processor, older uh, system, and not under high stress with doing a full benchmark on, on the production side. Like I said, this system is just not even breaking a sweat here. And you can look at the ZFS file system. Here's those rewrite caching. So you, because we have layers of caching, layers of efficiency, it's highly efficient here at caching because the green represents the cache hits but inefficient when you're doing uh, a bunch of random read with benchmarks. And that's what you should do. You wanna exhaust the cache because until you start exhausting the cache, you don't get any real performance statistics because not everything's gonna be cached. But on the other side of that, ZFS overall, and I think it lets me, is it control? Nope, wrong one. There is a way you can, there we go. We can zoom out. Most of the time, this is scrolling out over time. There's actually a lot of cache hits from just the day-to-day -day running. Uh, this is where we loaded an update. Um, but when you're doing the day-to-day -day running, there's actually a lot of cache hits that you get. I don't have the whole time frame for how long this is. But these, um, what the cache hits are going to do, okay, this is not last so many hours. Uh, this allows the system to 
be really efficient. So that's why I said benchmarks can be a little bit tricky and let's figure out if they're done yet. So here's what it sees on this side of I08. Here's what the throughput was as car as far as the production drive seen here. So uh writes at 377. I'm sorry, yeah, right uh it reads at 376, writes at 537. Really weird that the writes are so high. Maybe it's just the way this benchmark runs. Oh, and you can have multiple windows of this open. So we'll go here, stats. Here's the stats for this. There's the peak here. And the same thing, 537 uh, on the writes and 375 on the read. Pretty fast drive. Like I said, this is just a ZFS2, four drives, not SSD. So if someone asked me why I don't have SSD on all these, that's why. I mean, this performance is adequate. Because by the way, I didn't shut down. I didn't isolate this. Because if you really want to do a benchmark, I need to shut down all my production stuff that are all doing stuff right now um, and all running on here, especially Windows. And it, if you want to run it for full performance, I need to shut down everything and only run one VM, run the performance, and do the test on there. So that being said, I'm not going to do that. It's uh, beyond the scope of this. But I want to give you guys an idea of what I'm running in here, how fast it is to simply clone, migrate, restart, or uh, do something with these VMs. And like I said, it's fast. It's really fast. Uh, we'll do the snapshot thing real quick. So let's do something real quick. Uh, benchmark is still running. Cancel it. So, uh, so here's these files, and we'll new snapshot. Snapshots created. RM star. Whoops. Yeah. RM dash RF star. Hey, why not really break it? RM dash R. RF <laughs> star. Cannot root really resources busy. Oh no, I have now broken this VM badly. <laughs> Let's. LS can't be found. Come on. Can I change directory? No, no root. Well, we have truly broken. I. Uh... Oh, okay. We, we broke it. It's completely broke. How fast will it do a restore? Will exit work? Okay, exit work. Can you SSH back in? Yeah, I can actually refuse. The services are all broken. <laughs> yep, this this VM is now we you know oopsed it, RM RF'd it. Let's roll it back. So we're gonna go over here and show you how fast we can revert VM to snapshot. Now it will if you want fork this and have another snapshot before. I don't need a copy of that mess. So we're just gonna hit OK. We watch it turn yellow just for a second while it spins and does its magic. And it's already restored and booting back up. Four, three, two, one. Let's count this, how quick it boots back up. And it's ready. I know once it gets to this screen, it's just starting the services. So I, got, I was able to get one sip of coffee in here. Oh, look, everything's not deleted. So uh, if you're wondering about just how well this system performs, it performs that well. And part of the other advantage of having this on ZFS is I can snapshot the ZFS as well and uh, also have that extra layer of redundancy in case I needed to restore all the VMs at once for some unknown reason. I do keep a uh, snapshot, but only for a couple days. Just on the off chance there's something so horrible happens that I have to uh, restore that. Never has happened, but just the thoughts there. Uh, but that's kind of it for the video, the tour of how my lab is set up um, and what we're using. It's kind of the combination lab production, but it's where a lot of these VMs live that we're doing videos on. Maybe tomorrow I'll get to the FreeNAS with uh, Active Directory and Windows and integration. A lot of people have asked me for it, so I want to do a video on it. They've, they've come so far with FreeNAS, it integrates really well. That's that video I was talking about that I'll get to later. Uh, but this is the lab by which I set it up. And as you notice, I don't spend a lot of time waiting for things to happen. It's just now, everything's very fast. I can open up multiple windows so I can see multiple things. I can move VMs around, migrate them wherever I want. So this is the migration. Like I said, I can migrate it to another server. Stop, okay. Uh, and also when I'm done with these, like this YouTube demo one, we're gonna delete it and that's where we'll end the video. So let's go over here. I'm gonna hit remove. Are you sure you wanna delete all VM disks? Oh, uh, real, real quick, this is this is something really neat. Uh, I will, if you try to 
delete multiple things. And then we go to more. Enter the following text, delete three VMs. I like, oh, it won't let me copy paste it either. I think that's great. <laughs> um, I can copy paste this, but they purposely don't want it. They, they have a, some safety for uh, not wanting things to uh, be dumb. Uh, so you can't overly do things. And by the way, if you didn't notice when you're doing this, like if I do production, I can do, I can select them and perform a task. I can stop all of them, start all of them, reboot all of them, migrate all of them, copy all of them, suspend, force reboot all of them, or snapshot all of them at once. This is, this is why Zen Orchestra was really impressive for managing things at scale, because uh, I can, from a web interface, go, do this, start these or stop these. And if you stop this many VMs or start this many VMs, it has a confirmation. Are you sure you want to start all those or start up all those? Uh, this makes it really easy because if you want to do a backup, you can select all of them or not select all of them, uh, it, just to make it very easy to start, stop, and group. And you can use it by a tag, a filter. So I can use the word uh, Debian. Whoop, they got to spell Debian, right? And find all these, you know, or type the word lab. And just so I'm clear how these got the tag lab in them, I can call them Tom. There, there's the Tom label. <laughs> this one has the tag Tom. You can, it's all filtered in uh, expressions right there. And if you want to remove that, there we go, it's gone. So this, like I said, very powerful tool, play around with it. It's really, really uh, neat and has all kinds of options. You can, I saved lab and production in here, but you can save more. A uh, really slick system. Point, I'm gonna cover this separately at some point, the backup, backup, NG. I'm still learning how it all works, so I wanna get better at it. Uh, settings, servers, and all that. These are pretty straightforward jobs and sand. But this is a good overview of it. Uh, definitely enough to get you started with it. It's it's free to load, free to download. I'll leave links where to get all this. Uh, the details of the setup I've covered before, but if you look at my Citrix video, just replace anywhere I say Citrix with XCPNG, and pretty much that works. It's the install process the same. And if you are someone who followed my Citrix videos and you're wondering, we now, results may vary. <laughs> Be careful, back up, back up, back up before. We loaded on top of uh, Citrix and got all these working um, everywhere. So all the places, all three servers, I overwrote on the top and everything just worked perfectly fine. So that's how we got to this and it works fine. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, go ahead and click the thumbs up. Leave us some feedback below to let us know any details, what you like and didn't like as well, because we love hearing the feedback or if you just want to say thanks, leave a comment. If you want to be notified of new videos as they come out, go ahead and hit the subscribe and the bell icon. That lets YouTube know that you're interested in notifications. Hopefully they send them, <laughs> as we've learned with YouTube. Anyways, if you want to contract us for consulting services, you go ahead and hit lawrencesystems.com and you can reach out to us for all the projects that we can do and help you. We work with a lot of uh, small businesses, IT companies, even some large companies, and you can farm different work out to us or just hire us as a consultant to help design your network. Also, if you want to help the channel in other ways, we have a Patreon. We have affiliate links. You'll find them in the description. You'll also find recommendations to other affiliate links and things you can sign up for on lawrencesystems.com. Once again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.